Welcome to the third session of our wonderful course on um, leadership in crisis with our friend, our long-standing friend, George Drake. I have a little announcement to make before we start. The college would like me to uh, announce that the convocation at the college next Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, the 8th, at noon will be on um, um, reforming urban schools living on the boundary of doubt and belief. So anybody that's interested in education and the, and the future of education, I gather this is going to be an extremely interesting talk. It's at noon next Wednesday and there will be a sandwich served so you don't have to worry about lunch. But it will be in Sebring Lewis Hall over at the college. No, Rosenfield Center, I'm sorry. Rosenfield Center, room 101. And now for the third class of our wonderful course on crisis and uh, uh, leadership in crisis, George Drake, thank you. Thanks very much, Nisa. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, it's interesting what the college has done with its convocations, moving them to noon on Wednesdays, and the one way they get you there is to feed you. Uh, and by the way, it might be a great talk, and it certainly will be uh, next Wednesday. So you can sort of flee from the bucket course and go to a college convocation and get your sandwich. And, uh, I, re I highly recommend it. Uh, welcome, and welcome to our viewers on the, on the college website. I didn't explain, uh, I may have explained the first time, but we, our committee has organized this experiment with the college. Uh, I think present company accepted why, when you, when you think of, uh, you know, Clark Lindgren's or Eric McIntyre's lectures, and we ought to bottle those, and this is our chance to bottle them for uh, And in, also for many of our alums, they're older and don't know some of the younger faculty, as, but it's good to see some of the, that, that the college is still in very good hands. And also, those the older folks, if they do remember, we're, we're active as well in, in these bucket courses. I, I want to just take a moment to comment on the handout that's sitting on your table. We'll almost, uh, I, knowing me, will almost certainly not get to it today. <laughs> but uh, actually, uh, almost by accident, by getting a bit behind, I'm doing the right thing with the handouts, giving them to you a week ahead, so you can look at them in the intervening week before we actually discuss them next time. But I will explain a little bit about these, because obviously the first one must be a surprise. We're talking about Gandhi, and here is uh, the fifth, sixth, and seventh chapters of the Christian Gospel of Matthew. But as Gandhi said, uh, when, he, when he was a student in London, why, uh, many of his fellow students recommended he look at the Bible. Uh, he was a Hindu, uh, and as you probably know, Hindus are quite eclectic. They're quite willing to borrow from other religions. Uh, they're not exclusive in that way. And so he started, you know, as one would do at the beginning with the uh, Hebrew scriptures, and he found them awful and boring. <laughs> But he skipped ahead, and when he when he got actually to the uh, gospel, and then read the Sermon on the Mount and uh, of, of Matthew five, six, and seven, he said it it reached to my heart. And so this is at the very very core of for Gandhi's religious formation. He, he still remains a Hindu, and there's lots of Hinduism that and uh, Islam that appeals to. But this was one of the one of the most important uh, religious documents for Gandhi, and look at that. I mean, if you read uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount, it's pretty radical stuff. What we are admonished to do, and I would say virtually none of us is able to adhere to that, or even maybe thinks we ought to. But Gandhi will find out. It pretty comes pretty close to adhering to it. He was. A, absolutely uncompromising purpose, person in many respects, and it's according to the kind of principles that you find in the Sermon on the Mount. So it's, it's an important document in uh, Gandhi's life. Then you have a, a map of India, and the uh, area, this sort of projection over on the southwest corner, 
Gujarat is where Gandhi grew up and that was his culture. Gujarati was his native language and so uh, to the degree I won't do much reference to geography but you'll have a little bit there. Then within the rest of the documents there's uh, a, a short section on Satyabhagaha. I'm not, not pronouncing that very well but that's the sort of heart of Gandhi's nonviolent principle and then on the boat coming back from England to South Africa. He spent more than 20 years in South Africa, and that's where he really developed his strategies for the Indian community living in Nepal. And on one of his journeys back and forth to England, he wrote a pamphlet, a fairly extensive pamphlet, called Indian Home Rule, which was published in 1909, first in Gujarati and then later translated into English. And there's a number of sections here which are really crucial to understanding uh, Gandhi's ideas. And that they're sort of chopped up here, but it goes on for quite a while. You notice it goes, I think, the bulk of the handout is from that particular document. Then finally, or not quite finally, and ultimately, the Darasana Salt Raid, Gandhi's famous salt march in 1930, where he takes a whole bunch of people and walks 200 miles to the ocean and makes salt. The, the British had a high tax on salt. They controlled salt production. And this was a typical sort of Gandhi thing. You know, the salt's there, abundantly available for all of us. And then the British, you know, put, put a screen down and prevent us from using it and then sell it to us at high prices. Why are we letting them do that? Why, why do we grow cotton, send it off to Manchester, and then they send it back to us in the form of European clothing and we buy it <laughs> at, at high prices. Uh, isn't the loincloth adequate? And we're used to the image of Gandhi walking around in a loincloth. We reject all of this Western clothing. Uh, it's just part of the exploitation of the colonial power over the colonists. So uh, subsequent to the march, then there was a, a raid on the salt pans, uh, the Darasama salt raid, which gives you a good illustration of the discipline of Gandhi's followers. Gandhi wasn't even there, he was in jail. But his followers, uh, this account, and if you've ever seen the Gandhi movie, it's, it's graphically depicted in the Gandhi movie with these people marching right up to club wheeling soldiers who just beat them down. A couple, three died, and over 100 were bad injured. Just in, in, a, in a dramatic demonstration of nonviolent protest. Um, and that's described by a United Press uh, journalist. And Gandhi was very good, just as Martin Luther King made sure the television cameras were there for the marches and demonstrations. In the pre-television age, Gandhi made sure the newspapers were there and covering uh, his actions. And finally, uh, in the Gandhi material, some, some, uh, he's addressing himself to the Jews and then to Europe generally in the Nazi era. And I think you'll find, I won't, won't tell you what you're going to find there, I think you'll find it surprising. It's an illustration of Gandhi's consistency with respect to how you oppose injustice and power. And he thought you could use nonviolence to oppose Hitler, He's advising the Jews and the Europeans to do that. Essentially saying, if you lie down in front of him, he'll, he'll reach his conscience and he'll change his way. Uh, so as I say, you'll find that rather interesting for virtually as I look around the audience, there's hardly anyone here who didn't experience World War II in some, some fashion, either as a kid or as a soldier and so on. All right, now uh, to the uh, issue of the moment, namely Abraham Lincoln. And uh, I hope that you, uh, enough of you brought your handouts from last time because I am intending to refer to them today. And I will, uh, particularly for the benefit of those watching online, I will read sections of those. So if, if you don't have it in front of you, I, uh, you'll at least hear it. So in an early handout, uh, I gave you the very briefest outline of uh, Lincoln's dates, major dates in his lifetime. Born, as we know, in 1808, uh, we just passed uh, 2000, 2000, excuse me, 1809, because that was 2009 and there was lots of emphasis on Lincoln, and obviously dying in 1865, uh, just, what, within two weeks of Appomattox. So 
one of the points I'm going to make is he's the only United States president whose virtually his entire presidency was consumed by war. Uh, there was never a wartime president. It was Abraham Lincoln. And where many of you in this room know at least as much, if not more, about Lincoln than I do. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really going to try to focus on his leadership qualities because I don't claim to be a, a Lincoln scholar or even a person who is just steeped in Lincolnia or however we describe it. As we know, there are more books about Lincoln, certainly, than any of our presidents. And many people uh, who might not generally be interested in history are interested in Lincoln and interested in the Civil War. So it draws a lot of attention. Uh, so I don't, I don't claim to know more than many of you in this room. So I'm hoping to leave time at the end when we can uh, have conversation. But we are, you know, we so are utterly fascinated with Lincoln because he embodies what we like to think of as the American experience. It really doesn't matter where you come from. We like to believe. Uh, if you are sufficiently talented, sufficiently disciplined, uh, sufficiently aggressive, you can make your headway into society. Anyone might grow up to be the President of the United States. And lest anyone say impossible, we point to Abraham Lincoln, with the most obscure beginnings, uh, whose mother died when he was about 10 years old. Unfortunately, his stepmother is someone that he looks up to and learns from. He didn't particularly like his father, a uh, hard scrabble farmer, who really regarded Abe as quite lazy and inadequate. He, he, he grows up with a sense of inadequacy because Abe has other interests, and his interests are highly intellectual. Uh, and that, if this is from a father who absolutely can't understand those interests and has, uh, you know, the, the, the most basic experience of how hard life is. And this is a family that moves around to find better soil and better opportunities on the American frontier. So again, the embodiment of the frontier experience and Lincoln, you know, after successions of East Coast presidents, a few uh, like Jackson, who were essentially from a frontier state, but not very many, uh, who have managed to rise to the presidency rather, rather surprisingly. We've commented on the fact that he had at most one year of formal education. So he is a self-educated person, and that intellectual drive that so motivated him and so disappointed his father was what uh, managed to produce I don't think there's any question that he is the most literally accomplished president we've ever had, whose command of the spoken and written English language is absolutely stunning. Uh, those of us who are Democrats like to point to Barack Obama, who quite, who quite literally wrote books. He did, they weren't ghostwritten, they were his own books, and very good books. Uh, many of us in the room have read at least one of them. But o Obama doesn't touch Lincoln, really, as a craftsperson of the English language. And it comes, he said himself, from his reading of the King James Bible, and again, we know that he was not, in a formal sense, a religious person. He was not a regular church attender by any means. But increasingly, as the Civil War unfolds and the tragedy of the Civil War, one, one senses the spiritual depth of a man, and we're going to look at the second inaugural address where he's a, it's almost a self-reflective approach to our national experience and to his personal experience. What have we done so to offend God to bring this carnage on ourselves? This is part of what we see in the second inaugural. So the, the, he not only learned to his literature, his, his literary capacities from the King James Bible, he obviously absorbed many of the messages. Aesop's fables and many of his metaphors and stories have to do with animals. And, and uh, the scholars usually think that he's drawing that from, not only from his personal experience as a farm kid, but uh, from Aesop's fables. Euclid, you know, those of us, and probably everyone in the room has seen Lincoln by now, 
Uh, now it's available on DVD, so if you haven't seen it in the theaters, get it. it it's, a, it's a movie, I think, that translates well to the smaller screen. Uh, but you, you'll remember the Euclidean uh, statement that he makes uh, sitting in the war office, the telegraph office, uh, trying, to, trying to make a major decision. Then Shakespeare. Uh, he was steeped in Shakespeare. So, uh, and in the case of the King James Bible in Shakespeare, you've got the same English language coming from exactly the same period. King James Bible appeared in 1610, uh, sort of at the height of Shakespeare's productivity early in the reign of James I. He also talked about the fact that he would, uh, in his little room, I think it was kind of a loft in their one-room cabin, uh, where he'd hear the elders, his father and others, talking and trying to figure out what they meant. And feeling very frustrated that he, that adult uh, conversation was some sort of obscure to him. So he, he develops a capacity, or maybe developed, maybe not, not might be the wrong word, sort of innate capacity. He wants to understand. And one of his greatest um, skills as a lawyer was that he could make the case of his opponent better than his opponent could. He felt understanding uh, the other side's case was absolutely essential to developing your own case in, in its most adequate form. But there were countless examples where Lincoln understood the other side probably even better than they understood their case. So he has this sort of drive to project uh, intellectually into another person's experience and another person's thought. As a lawyer, he's essentially self-taught. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's hard, in a way, kind of hard for me to talk about this because I'm such a proponent of education and I've been known frequently to say that education is really the key to our society. When you think of the experience of countless immigrant groups to this country and the ability of second and third generations to rise quote to the top and almost in every case it's a result of education. Susan, my son Chris teaches inner city Detroit elementary school has done so for 18 years and he's sort of carrying out what I think is the ultimate commitment to our society because if you are educated you really do have a chance almost from wherever you come and for most of us it's formal education in school. For Lincoln education clearly was important but he was the master of his own education. There's no question at all that he was self-taught so I as a college person have to admit it's very, very possible to do this without going to college. It's nice to have the, have the uh, diploma, the certification, but in fact there are a lot of people who don't go to college, and particularly, again, some of us of older generation here have lots of people. It wasn't quite as common uh, until after World War II for people to have a college education, but people who succeeded quite well with the ability to develop their own intellectual capacity. Um, as you probably, well, you all, all know this, that he rode the circuit in Illinois as a, as a lawyer. Uh, and that was sort of the way the courts worked, was the, the judges traveled around. There weren't enough magistrates for every community, so they, they followed the sort of great Anglo-Saxon tradition that, that was developed in England in the Middle Ages. As, and again, I'm, I won't divert too much to this, but uh, that was the way the, the state-run judicial process developed. Well, there weren't very many lawyers uh, and, so, and judges, so you moved the courts around. You actually, unfortunately, put people in jail until the court arrived. And then they would, it was called in England jail delivery. Uh, you got <laughs> delivered from jail into court, and then you might be freed or you might be returned to jail, depending on how the case came out. But, uh, what the lawyers, at least many of them did, and Lincoln certainly did this, was rode, he rode the circuit. Again, you can think about you know, he's staying in boarding houses, hotels, going into all these small Illinois communities, and the degree to which he's able to understand people. And that's, I think, one of his great uh, leadership qualities, is this understanding of human nature and the way that people think and do things. Again, what could be a better experience of that than to have 
you know, traveling around and interacting with people and wherever you're eating, wherever you're traveling, wherever you're staying, but also dealing with people at the level of a court experience as well. He had a tiny bit, as again you know, of military experience, not actual combat, but sort of militia experience in the Black Hawk War in 1832. So uh, when he becomes commander-in-chief, he's got a lot to learn, and he does teach himself the things he needs to know, but he also has an idea of what it's like to be a soldier in the field and face all of the difficulties of that kind of life. So when you think of that collection of experiences, it's maybe not too surprising that he decides to do politics. And again, uh, most historians would argue that he was one of the great politicians to inhabit uh, the White House, uh, then called the Executive Mansion. But uh, again, the, I, I, think, I think that Lincoln movie, I mean, again, I'm not a, I'm not a real Lincoln scholar, but to me as a historian, there was so much that rang through. They really tried very hard. It was, it's Hollywood, and there's a lot of invention, a lot of invention of dialogue. But uh, the kinds of experiences that are depicted in that movie are really typical and very good for understanding Lincoln. And think of the maneuvering that Lincoln is involved with, either through surrogates or directly, as he's trying to convince members of the House of Representatives, and particularly the House of Representatives, to vote for the 13th Amendment, and the kind of pressure, underhanded, down and dirty <laughs> pressure that's exerted on those folks, and that they're, they're not uh, maligning Lincoln. Lincoln was very capable of that kind of action. He was a he was a politician right down to his toenails, and so it, 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 he, it, that's the way he lived his life. And it's not surprising that he would enter politics in the way that many, many, if not most, politicians do it through state politics. And he was in the Illinois legislature four times from 1834 to 1841. And then he has, as we all know, a time, 1847 to 49, when he's in the U.S. House of Representatives, a one-year term. He was at that time a Whig. The, the two parties were the Whigs and the Democrats. And uh, the today's Republican Party has a lot of different sort of origins. Uh, today's Democratic Party has a singular origin and many lives. Uh, when you think of it as the, the party of Jefferson, uh, I mean, in other words, you can f find a, a direct lineage from sort of one generation to the next when you're tasting the Democratic Party right back to Jefferson through Jackson. Then you, you get to the Democratic Party that we're dealing with at the Civil War, and most of us in this room would say, what a terrible party. Uh, they are the regressive a party that doesn't want to see change, defends slavery, uh, you know, and, and the Whigs are, uh, well, they're certainly not the heirs to the Federalists, but they do believe more in strong federal government and federal action, where the Democrats are states' rights folks at this time. Uh, but the Whig Party did, at that period, quite have the, 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 the horsepower to defeat the Democrats broadly. And, and they were not sufficiently abolitionist in their approach. So the abolitionists get behind the new party movement in the mid to late 1850s uh, and create a new party, the Republican Party. Now today's Republican Party owes its, that's the root of today's Republican Party. Its politics are different today. The Democratic Party's politics are different, so we have an almost total reversal of approach to federal power uh, that, with respect to these two parties. But it's just really, I mean, I'm not, a, again, not an authority on parties, but I find it fascinating to see the evolution of parties and they sort of sing sort of, the evolution looks like this, <laughs> rather than certainly straight line. So Lincoln shifts over to the, from the Whig party to this new party called the Republicans. Um, he, uh, after that uh, singular term in Congress, where in fact he did oppose the Mexican War, uh, and so he was a sort of anti-war uh, politician at that particular juncture, and he only has one term, and then he sort of disappears back into the Illinois scene as a lawyer and living his life. But he gets smoked out 
in the mid-1850s by a thing called the Kansas-Nebraska Bill of 1854. There had been, and again, these are all terms that through our high school history and other history experiences, and with some of you quite a bit more than that, that are familiar to us, the Missouri Compromise of 1820. It's back to that same old problem that we saw with the making of the Constitution and Washington. What are you going to do about slavery? What are you going to do about the differences between the North and the South, their economies, their social structure, etc.? Well, it's, it's one of the issues is balancing the states within the federal system. And uh, Maine was ready to become a state. So was Missouri. Less ready, but nevertheless ready in 1820. And the idea was that there were balance between slave and free states at that time. Let's preserve the balance. And the Missouri Compromise is that balance. So Missouri comes in not as a, uh, what shall we say, a totally slave state in terms of its own population but a state that will allow slavery. Maine comes in as obviously a state that won't, won't have slaves. So you, you maintain the constitutional balance. And then they project this line, which is uh, 36 degrees and 30 minutes, essentially the line between the state of Oklahoma and Kansas projected right across. Uh, and everything south of that could be slave, everything north of it could be free. That's, not, that's the idea as new states are developing. And, you know, even when they're making the Constitution, at the Constitutional Convention, they're really tied up about the issue of what are you going to do about new states uh, and, what, and the way that that's going to balance uh, our country, slave and free. Well, after the Mexican War, we've acquired a whole lot more property in the West. And that, again, raises the issue of that projected line might go a long way as West. It isn't now... <laughs> now uh, blocked by Mexican land. So it's a bigger, getting to be a bigger issue. And so they go back to the drawing board with respect to the Missouri Compromise. And in 1854, they come up with the Kansas-Nebraska Bill, which uh, in a democratic sense sounds really good. We'll let each state, as it or territory, as it's forming into a state, vote, let its citizens vote, free or slave. Uh, as, and let, let it be a democratic free choice. There's a lot to recommend. And the democratic senator from Illinois, Stephen Douglas, was a primary architect of the Kansas-Nebraska bill. This incensed Lincoln because he could foresee the kind of contest you're going to have, and it was going on. Bloody Kansas. Uh, John Brown. And uh, we were part of it in Iowa, 1846. Iowa becomes a state, and guess what? A lot of New England abolitionists say, we've got to get out there and make sure when that vote comes up that uh, we're a free state. We vote free, not slave. J.B. Grinnell decides to come out and found a colony on the prairie of abolitionists. And he modestly named it Grinnell. Uh, we, we're, we're a part of, we and Grinnell Iowa are, are deeply a part of that history because the abolitionists and pro-slave people are driving, and, you know, in a, in a, in a, a self-conscious and directed way. I mean, J.B. came out, he scouted the prairie to find a place for his colony. He was lucky enough to find this spot. What better place in, in the prairie than to have to be right here where we are? Uh, and, and, and by the way, two railroads happened to intersect. <laughs> that that would have helped in making your choice. So um, it's it, it's a contentious, tremendously contentious time, and it's hard for a person with deep political thoughts and motivations to stay out of it. And then Lincoln is a really a pretty good constitutional lawyer. He never, at this point in his life, and never will until the 1862 challenge the right of the South, Old South states, to be slave. Because as we saw in the very first of these lectures and in, in that handout, there's quite a bit in the Constitution that, that has to do with slavery and 
in a broad sense, protects slavery where it exists. But the Constitution has nothing to say about the territories and the future of this country with respect to slavery and freedom. And Lincoln's position right from the beginning is there is no mandate for slavery in the territories and we must prevent it from spreading. I'll accept it where it is, but I will prevent it from spreading. So he enters in to uh, the political process. He tries for a Senate seat in 1855. We're still at a point where uh, the, the state legislatures are appointing the senators. Uh, in 1858, he runs against Stephen Douglas for uh, the uh, Senate. And that, that leads to the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates. And I, here's where we're going to spend a little time with, with the handouts. And, and, and at first, the first, there's, we'll skip around a little bit, but at first we won't skip. So I'm in the Lincoln handout, and the very first of the uh, pages on, on the back of the front page, Fragment on Slavery, possibly from 1854. And this is, this is I've got it out for you because it's such a typical way for Lincoln to just deal straightforwardly, logically, and simply with a very complex issue. So, he says, says Lincoln, if A can prove, however conclusively, that he may of right enslave B, why may not B snatch the same argument and prove equally that he may enslave A? Could work either way, says Lincoln. You say A is white and B is black. It is color then, the lighter having the right to enslave the darker. Take care. By this rule, you are to be slave to the first man you meet with fairer skin in your own. <laughs> oh, you do not mean exactly color. You mean that whites are intellectually the superiors of the blacks and therefore have the right to enslave them. Take care. By this rule, you are to be slave to the first man you meet with an intellect superior to your own. But, you say, it is a question of interest, and if you can make it your interest, you have the right to enslave another. Very well. And if he can make it his interest, he has the right to enslave you. So, you know, it's a pretty simple, straightforward, logical argument as to why should one human being have the right to enslave another. It's not a matter of right. I mean, what's unsaid here is pretty much a matter of power. You have the power and you do it. Well, we're all familiar with the fact that Stephen Douglas and Abraham Lincoln conducted seven debates around the state of Illinois uh, during that uh, senatorial election of 1858. And I've given you fairly extensive uh, quotations from two of them, the fourth and the seventh Lincoln-Douglas debate. And I want to uh, read from both of those because the first one that I have for you is rather, I guess, sort of surprising. Question, one of the questions we have is what was Lincoln's real attitude toward blacks, toward freed slaves? Now, we know what his attitude toward slavery was, but what about a society that projects itself out as a non-slave society where four million of its inhabitants are black and either descendants of or actually former slaves? How are that population going to be absorbed into the European white population of the United States? And again, we know that Lincoln had various colonization schemes and that Liberia already existed as a colony for free American slaves. And um, what, what's, this, this, this particular quote gets at something in a basic attitude, but one has to take it with a little slight grain of salt because Douglas is going around in these debates accusing Lincoln of being a lover of blacks. And he's not going to be elected. Lincoln won't become senator of Illinois if he's a lover of blacks. So he's got to establish some distance. So it's partly political, but I think also gets at some of his, maybe his genuine feelings. And this is a, the fourth debate uh, in Charleston, Illinois. I'm, I'm starting at the beginning here. While I was at the hotel today, an elderly gentleman called upon me to know whether I was really in favor of producing a perfect equality between the Negroes and white people. Great laughter. I will say then that I am not, nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. 
and then there's applause. <laughs> then I am not nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. And I will say in addition that, that to this, that there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. Now, if anyone said that in our society today, wow, that you would be elected dog catcher. I mean, you might be yeah. in Mississippi, but not, one, not many places. And inasmuch as they cannot so live while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior, and I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. I say upon this occasion, I do not perceive that because the white man is to have the superior position, the Negro should be denied everything. Okay, so the, white, the Negro should have some rights. I do not understand that because I do not want a Negro woman for a slave, I would necessarily want her for a wife. Cheers and laughter. My understanding is that I can just let her alone. I am now in my 50th year, and I certainly never have had a black woman for either a slave or a wife. So it seems to me quite possible for us to get along without either slaves or wives of Negroes. And I will add to this that I have never seen to my knowledge a man, woman, or child who was in favor of producing a perfect equality, social and political, between Negroes and white men. And probably he's right, though he hasn't been living in Massachusetts. And he might have found some abolitionists who <coughs> did feel that way. I have never had the least apprehension that I or my friends would marry Negroes. If there was no law to keep them from it, laughter. But as Judge Douglas and his friends seemed to be in great apprehension that they might, if there were no law to keep them uh, from it, roars of laughter, I give him the most solemn pledge that I will to the very last stand by the law of this state which forbids the marrying of white people and Negroes. And then a bit further down, and I won't, you know, I'll just read it, not, not make you try to see, find it. It's in the next paragraph. He shall have no occasion to ever ask it again, for I tell him very frankly that I am not in favor of Negro citizenship. So that was an issue as well. So if you, if you were to take the Lincoln of the fourth debate, uh, there's some questionable things there. Okay, I'm, I'm getting this aside from Judy that we need to stop very shortly. So I will, we'll, we'll stop uh, after I read a little bit. And it's going to, it'll be, I think, short, yeah, shorter from the seventh Lincoln Douglas, seventh and uh, that one in Alton, Illinois, in the last few days. Where I'm starting, and this takes a little bit of searching, I'm actually ten lines down from the beginning of that quotation, with the sentence that, that begins the real issue of this controversy. You see that one? It sort of begins in the middle of the line. The real issue in this controversy, the one pressing upon every mind, is the sentiment on the part of one class that looks upon the institution of slavery as wrong, and of another class that does not look upon it as wrong. Okay, very simple proposition. Some people, some classes say it's wrong, some say it's, it's not wrong. The sentiment that contemplates the institution of slavery in this country as wrong is the sentiment of the Republican Party. It is the sentiment around which all their actions, all their arguments circle, from which all of their propositions radiate. They look upon it as being a moral and social and political wrong, and while they contemplate it as such, they nevertheless have the due regard for its actual existence among us. So, in other words, we recognize its constitutional existence. We're not, we're not saying we want slavery to totally disappear from this nation and the difficulty is getting rid of it. They know it would be hard uh, of it in any satisfactory way to all the constitutional obligations thrown about it. Yet, having a due regard for these, they desire a policy in regard to it that looks to its not creating any more danger, no more growth. They insist that it should, as far as may be treated, be treated as a wrong, and one of the methods of treating it as a wrong is to make provision that it shall not grow larger. So there's the real issue that Lincoln is arguing. No more spread of slavery. And then uh, going down to the next paragraph, and I want to read about the first eight or nine lines of that paragraph. On this subject of treating it as a wrong and limiting its spread, let me say a word. 
Has anything ever threatened the existence of this union, save and except this very institution of slavery? You couldn't have a constitution without accepting slavery. You can't have a union without accepting slavery. What is it that we hold most dear amongst us? Our own liberty and prosperity. What has ever threatened our liberty and prosperity, save the and accept this institution of slavery. If this is true, how do you propose to improve the condition of things by enlarging slavery? Since it's our worst problem, how do you make things better by extending it and making it even more of a problem? By spreading it out and making it bigger. You may have a wen or a cyst or a cancer, here's, here's Lincoln's metaphor, upon your person and not be able to cut it out lest you bleed to death. But surely it is no way to cure it, to engraft it, and spread it over the whole body. I mean, how powerful can it be to use language in that way? Okay, let's take our, our break now, and we will continue uh, with Lincoln. Second half, I need to make a couple of announcements before George comes back up here. Uh, the announcement is basically, uh, you, uh, George alluded to it earlier, uh, they are going to be putting this on the internet, so eventually you'll be able to watch this again if you want to on the internet, if, you're, you, know, if you have a computer of that, free of charge. We have been making a, a second camera over here, which is a high definition camera, and that goes to channel 12, or to anybody who wants a copy of it. And if you want a personal copy of any class, in that it's a high definition, we only can fit one class on one disc. And we're charging $3 a disc. So if you would like the whole five sessions of George, you can have those and we'll make you copies. And they'll be $3 per disc. If you have just one particular class you think you would like to have, say I'd like class three or class four, we can do that as well. But you can also see it free on the internet eventually. But we're doing this double thing so that we can supply a disc to channel 12, which you can also watch the week after. So it, it's your prerogative. If you want one to have it your own, sign up out here before you leave today. And it's $3 per disc. And there will be five sessions of this. We have two more after today. Um, the other note I was given here, if you do ask questions, we ask you to be short. So uh, see, please ask questions short so all have a chance to ask, I guess. I'm just read them out. Anyway, don't, uh, just make your questions short if you do answer. Thank you. George? <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Um, you know, it's, it's, Joanne's not well today, so that's why she hasn't been here making the announcements, but this gives you a chance to see some of the other folks on this committee. She comments about the hardworking committee, and they, they really are. I mean, it's all this set up and so on, and the uh, video that's been done over the years, it's been part of the, a huge part of the success of the pocket courses. I'm on the committee, but my primary job is to try to scout out possible presenters, and so I'm the lazy one. <laughs> These other folks really work, and with all the quality we have at the college, it's not too hard to find really good presenters. Okay, um, the uh, sort of once Lincoln becomes president, and as you know, even before he's uh, inaugurated, seven states had withdrawn from the Union. Uh, there was, I mean, it's, it's just quite literally the case. The election of Abraham Lincoln split the country because he represented the Republican Party and it was well known what the primary goal of the Republican Party was to prevent the spread of slavery. But the South, these, hard, these deep South states, read that, prevent the extension of slavery and take it away from us. They're absolutely convinced that it's going to be taken away from them. And a lot of what Lincoln does early in his administration, even as the war is beginning to break out, is to try to convince the South that that won't happen. 
uh, that he, he and his party are not a threat to the existence of slavery, but they are definitely a threat to the spread of slavery. And by the way, uh, Jim Kottmeyer caught me after and said, Did, didn't Lyndon Johnson have war all through his presidency? I said, no, no, maybe you're right. So, uh, beware of generalities that historians give you. Uh, they're, they're almost always something wrong with them. Um, but Lincoln had a bigger war. <laughs> and we were much more aware of it, uh, although we were pretty darn aware of, of Vietnam. So the first thing that Lincoln is doing is preserve the Union. And uh, there, there are, we have some uh, quotations, and, and I'm going to, some of these I'm going to cut out or really reduce, but this one causes us to skip over a few pages. And I'm going to a letter to Horace Greeley, which has got a label 31 at the top and page 130 at the bottom. And by the way, all of this material comes from this particular book, uh, which is uh, a very, very short, good, and inexpensive book to give you a really good idea of Lincoln's letters and speeches. But Horace Greeley, who, um, well, we know about Greeley supposedly, so the, and they have Davy Grinnell out here. But Greeley was a, an abolitionist type, uh, New York uh, newspaper man, and very much in favor of the war, but who gets cold feet rather rapidly uh, as the war doesn't go very well and becomes critical of the Lincoln administration. And Greeley has published an open letter, a critical letter, and this is Lincoln's open letter in response to Greeley. Uh, from August of 1862. I'm going to start with the second paragraph, that second short paragraph. As to the policy I seem to be pursuing, as you say, I am not meant to leave anyone in doubt. I would save the Union. I would save it the shortest way under the Constitution. The sooner the national authority can be restored, the nearer the Union will be the Union as it was. If there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time save slavery, I do not agree with them. I, if there be those who would not save the Union unless they could do at the, same, at the same time destroy slavery, I do not agree with them. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And, I, and if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union. And what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe help to save the Union. I shall do less whenever I shall believe that I am doing what I am doing hurts the cause. And I shall do more whenever I shall believe doing more will help the cause. I shall try to correct errors when shown to be errors. And I shall adopt new views so fast as they shall appear to be true views. I have here stated my purpose according to my view of official duty. And I intend no modification of my often expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. So he makes a distinction between his personal position, which is an anti-slavery position, and his position as President of the United States with an office to support the Constitution. Which Constitution is the Constitution of the Union? Of the Union of these states. So he sees this as absolutely essential to his, to his constitutional obligation again. Think of this as a published letter from the President of the United States and how powerful it is and expressive, a very subtle, actually, and, and for some people, a difficult position to accept. Um, there's another letter which I did not uh, Xerox for you because it's pretty long, but I want to read just a couple of sections from that letter, which again, admirably express Lincoln's view, and this time it's from 1864, after the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, I think you, you recognize, but I will, I will reiterate it. The Emancipation Proclamation was a war measure. 
Lincoln violated the Constitution and the Emancipation Proclamation. He emancipated the slaves in the South. He did so with his war powers to break the Constitution uh, because he felt that he, the North could not defeat the South so long as the South could rely on the labor of slaves. But if he could undercut the position of the South by depriving the South of at least its official capacity as slave owners, induce slaves to leave their masters and maybe even cross the lines and join to be Initially, he's thinking of workers for the Union Army, but eventually he puts them into uniform. Then he's made a, a real advance in terms of strengthening the Union and, or, and, and depriving the South of, of part of its strength. He's writing to uh, a man named uh, A.G. Hodges, who was the editor of the Frankfurt, Kentucky newspaper. He says to Hodges, I am naturally anti-slavery. If slavery is not wrong, Nothing is wrong. I cannot remember when I did not think so and feel. Yet I have never understood that the presidency conferred upon me an unrestricted right to act officially upon this judgment and feeling. It was in the oath I took that I should, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Then he goes on, and this is a reference to the Emancipation Proclamation, which Hodges has attacked as unconstitutional. I did understand, however, that my oath to preserve the Constitution to the best of my ability imposed upon me the duty of preserving by every indispensable means that government, that nation, of which the Constitution was the organic law. So what he's saying here is the nation is ahead of the Constitution. The Constitution was created to preserve the nation, but it is not so inviolable that if the nation begins to disintegrate, you cannot break the Constitution. That's, that's just logic. Was it possible to lose the nation and yet preserve the Constitution? By general law, life and limb must be protected. Yet often a limb must be amputated to save a life. But a life is never wisely given to save a limb. So you don't sacrifice the nation to the Constitution. You will sacrifice the Constitution to save the nation. I felt that measure otherwise unconstitutional might become lawful by becoming indispensable to the preservation of the Constitution through the preservation of the nation. So we preserve the nation, then we preserve the Constitution. So there are certain conditions. This is a great argument for those moments of crisis when you are justified in breaking the constitutional obligations that you have sworn to protect. So, uh, and, and, you know, again, just in a few sentences, he brilliantly explains the position that he has taken. So, um, saving the Union. And this might be take, take a few minutes right now. You folks have been sitting patiently and let, get a little response from you. Was it worth it? Uh, he, he's doing it as a constitutional major, but also a practical major, because he argues many times, okay, if you allow secession, when does it stop? Every time a state or a group feels that the majority is overriding their rights as a minority within uh, that majority institution, the, the government, then that minority could pick up and go off on its own. If you did let, let the South leave at once, why? Maybe you'll let Rhode Island go the next time, or whatever. So that so it's both constitution and practicality. But uh, six hundred thousand over six hundred thousand people died by far the bloodiest war in our nation. Uh, a civil war to fight, and Lincoln had a choice. He's the president. He could have let him go. Should he have done it? I mean, it's hard for us to say it now. We didn't have to suffer the civil war. But think if you can project yourself into that time. A lot of people, Northern Democrats especially, are arguing as the war unfolds and as it's going badly, the hell with it, let it go. It's just, it's just not worth it. John. This doesn't respond to your question, but I have a question. Did, did the letter to Horace Greeley get published at the time? Yes, the, letter, the question was, did the letter to Horace Greeley get published? Yes, it was a published letter. Yes. The, um, in the 1850s, 
and Lincoln's objection to the Kansas-Nebraska Act. I mean, there's a lot of economic reasons why those, at least Western Republicans, perhaps, I mean, they're not all abolitionists. There are other reasons why they oppose the Kansas-Nebraska Act, right? Yes. Now, the, the point I think you know, what Tommy Haas is driving at is that uh, there's some real practically tough practical issues if, if you're going to allow the split of North and South. Uh, at that point, you would have two sovereign powers occupying this particular thing that we now think of as the United States. And you've got the whole issue of Western expansion. Would they not have come to loggerheads and conflict over that? You know, I said, let them go. Now we'll fight about who's going to occupy the West. And would they, in other words, would you only postpone an inevitable violent conflict between North and South as the nation moves West and they try to, and now they're sovereign states. Nothing like a Kansas-Nebraska Act or Missouri Compromise is possible, probably, unless it'd be a treaty, and we know that nations break treaties. So you do really have an issue, and Lincoln is obviously, and again, part of Tommy, Tommy's point is he's a Westerner. He's Western, they're right at the edge in, in Illinois. Um, well, we in Iowa are right at the edge, <laughs> but they're pretty close to the edge. Uh, and uh, they would be acutely aware of what's going to happen next. So it's possible to argue that you merely postpone the inevitable conflict about Western expansion. And that's, you know, we know enough about our nation that that's that's the direction we're going. You're not going to stop it. So who's going to control westward expansion? So that, that's an issue to confront, too. And, and I think many people who argue about this would immediately go to that point of, could you ever have avoided it? Um, do, you, do you think if uh, Lincoln early on had any concept as to how expensive in lives and treasure in the world was going to be the length of time it would go on, and then, after the North won, what reconstruction would involve and uh, racial strife that was going to go on for more than a hundred more years, maybe he would have just said, okay, we'll have some countries, we'll have a different border, people can come and go as they please, we'll be colonies. Yeah, there, so the point, point being that uh, there's a lot of problems that you can anticipate that even if you say the North wins the Civil War, that you're still going to have in this society. And I, the, the comment about, I mean, certainly at the beginning of the war, nobody had any idea how expensive in human life it was going to be. You know, the South, in, in proportion, lost more of the military age, a higher proportion of the military age men than either France or Germany or any of the powers in, in, in World War I. We think of World War I as just absolutely decimating the young male population of Europe. But the South male, white male population of that, you know, 17 to 35 range was just decimated by the war. North lost more total men than the South, but the proportion of the South was so much less populated than the North. So I don't think any of them could an anticipate that. And so one argument would be you don't anticipate it's going to be such a bloody war, so of course you'll fight it. And, but uh, ultimately, then, but, but as you point out, it's how, Lincoln's acutely aware. How we, once we free these blacks, how we can live together? I mean, that really is front and center in his thought. And then Reconstruction. Uh, Lincoln's ideas of Reconstruction were less harsh than the radical Republicans who were in control of Reconstruction. So it might have been a less harsh uh, event or a series of events or time under Lincoln's control if he hadn't been assassinated. He was working on Reconstruction uh, in the last year uh, and actually had uh, Louisiana sort of, sort of on board with a, a more moderate Reconstruction policy. And he was pushing very hard at, at the last, again, this is an aspect of his leadership, with uh, compensated uh, freeing of the slaves. He quite logically argued it would be cheaper for this nation, probably the North, 
to pay southern slave owners for their loss of property than it is to continue this war. We could take the same amount of money we're investing in the war and compensate the slave owners and uh, we'd be better off. Everybody would be better off. And he was working particularly on the border, was working first with the border states who were uh, not engaged with the South but not terribly engaged with the North either as a buffer between uh, and those were what, Missouri, Mar Maryland, Delaware, and Kentucky, Kentucky were the border states that did not go with the Deep South. Uh, but nobody ultimately would buy that proposition. But he's thinking ahead about the issues that, you know, once we win this war, we've got a huge number of issues to, to deal with. Um, well, it, it, it's, it's one of those what ifs of history, and I won't uh, plague you with saying you've got to say a whole lot about it, but it, it's, it, you know, it is conceivable to argue that we shouldn't have fought the war. That Lincoln should have let them go. But he, I mean, that, that constitutional obligation of the Union and the practicality of how you would then con conduct the future with the possibility of secession any time a group really decided it needed to secede, he saw that as just a, a pathway down the tubes, really. Well, I, I uh, we, we need I need to move along here and save us some time by not doing quite as much with the quotations as I've been doing. But war leadership uh, as commander in chief is another of Lincoln's great attributes. Uh, he self-taught, as I said before. He he checked out a bunch of books on strategy from the Library of Congress as the war began and began to to study and, and to really sort of immerse himself in that reading. As we all know, and again we know this very well from the Lincoln movie, which I thought did a terrific job with it, sort of haunting the uh, War Office telegraph room. Yes. Uh, and so in order to maintain close connection with the commanders in the field, and we know that he had lots of difficulties with his commanders in the field, and probably if there's anything you know about the war, the uh, President and the Civil War is, how much difficulty he had with McClellan and so on. And so I've given you some examples uh, of that and, and invite you to, to look at them at your leisure, but I, won't, I was going to quote for a lot from them, but I think uh, I will not do so. There's also this wonderful photo of just after Antietam, which did happen to be a northern victory, and was the victory, it was a very bloody victory. In fact, I think Antietam was the bloodiest battle in the war and uh, did allow Lincoln then to move forward with the Emancipation Proclamation because he wasn't going to do it at the advice of his cabinet until they had a victory in which to kill. But Lincoln in his stove pipe hat standing next to McClellan, who's two persons to his left, and McClellan looks like he comes up to Lincoln's neck. Uh, and then you add another eight inches or so to Lincoln's height with the stovepipe hat, it looks extraordinary. And you can see where, where Lincoln's enemies would describe him as the gorilla. I mean, he's just so overpowering and raw, raw, not a, what we would think of as a handsome man, and so on. Um, so, but, but McClellan, he's constantly trying to get McClellan to move. McClellan always wants to build up his army, was sure that the opponents had more troops than he had. Uh, Lincoln was equally sure that they did not. Uh, McClellan's great attribute was he was a great trainer of an ar army, and I can say you can add also as an attribute, most of us in this room would agree, he didn't want to get his soldiers killed. He really did care about his soldiers. And uh, so he really did contribute because the Army of the Potomac became a much better fighting force with McClellan's constant training of the army, and he kept them alive by not over-engaging them uh, with, with the enemy. And But Lee is running circles around McClellan, and finally Lincoln does replace Mc McClellan. Um, I, there is one letter I think we'll, we will um, spend a little time with, uh, and <laughs> I, I excuse the fact that I didn't have a clean copy of this book, so you get my little notes. <laughs> Great letter, I say. A letter to Joseph Hooker, January 26, 1863. I mean, this, what, what, what a classic appointment letter from the Commander-in-Chief to a new commander of the Army, Major Army of the North, the Army of the Potomac. He says, Major General Hooker, and by the way, Major General was at this time 
the top ranked in the Army. Uh, he, pro he promotes Grant to Lieutenant General, and that's that, so Grant becomes the overall commander of the other armies, the ma head by Major General. So there's no General of the Army or Five Star General in, in this war. Major General Hooker, I have placed you at the head of the Army of the Potomac. Of course, I have done this upon what appear to me to be sufficient reasons. And yet I think it best for you to know that there are some things in regard to which I am not quite satisfied with you. I believe you to be a brave and a skillful soldier, which of course I like. I also believe you do not mix politics with your profession, in which you are right. You have confidence in yourself, which is a valuable, if not indispensable, quality. You are ambitious, which within reasonable bounds does good rather than harm. But I think that during General Burnside's command of the Army, that was his predecessor, you have taken counsel of your ambition and thwarted him as much as you could, in which you did a great wrong to the country and to a most meritorious and honorable brother officer. I have heard in such a way as to believe it of your recently saying that both the Army and the government needed a dictator. Of course, it was not for this, but in spite of it, that I have given you the command. Only those generals who gain successes can set up dictators. What I now ask you is military success. I will risk the dictatorship. <laughs> the government will support you to the utmost of its ability, which is neither more nor less than it has done and will do for all commanders. I much fear that the spirit which you have aided to infuse into the army of criticizing their commander and withholding confidence from him will now turn upon you. I shall assist you as far as I can to put it down. Neither you nor Napoleon, if he were alive again, could get any good out of an army while such a spirit prevails in it. And now beware of rashness, beware of rashness, but with energy and sleepless vigilance, go forward and give us victories. I just, you know, what an appointment. Uh, and then there's another letter to Hooker where he's advising him not to get his army straddling the Rappahannock River because I could pull over a fence while it'll be gnawed by the, by the dogs on the other side and won't be able to kick the dogs that are on the back of it. So, you know, these sort of animal metaphors that he commonly used. Then there's the letter to George B., which he never sent. Yeah. Uh, again, read that at, at your leisure, but it, it's, a, it's a, again, a very good letter because it's right after Gettysburg. And, uh, Meade had Lee sort of where, he, where most commanders would have wanted him, trapped by a flooded river, unable to get back to the south, and uh, not being pursued by, by Meade's army after Gettysburg. Now, I don't know, those military people here in the room would, could comment about this, but you can understand it's an exhausted army. It's just fought this three-day battle at Gettysburg. You kind of understand why my commander might say, they've had it, let's not push forward. But from Lincoln's point of view, they led a great opportunity uh, to escape from them. And, and that leaves the armies just as pummeled and uh, is trapped, in a sense, trapped. So he sent this letter, uh, no, it doesn't send, he writes this letter, then does not send it, expressing his deep disappointment in what Meade has done. And yet he's dealing with a commander who has won the greatest northern victory of the American Civil War. At least that's the way we celebrate Gettysburg now. So probably quite frankly, he doesn't send it. What he does do is he raises Grant to the level of Lieutenant General, leaves Meade in direct control of the Army of the Potomac, but puts Grant's over him and has Grant accompany the Army of the Potomac. So in a sense, Grant takes over the Army of the Potomac, and Meade must have been must have had a very bitter and frustrating experience because he really didn't have any leeway with Grant there with him and Grant had a different attitude. I mean, Grant is the sort of, you know, the historians refer to it as the awful arithmetic of the war. The North simply had more men than the South and could afford to lose more and that's what Grant did. He just kept pushing, pushing, pushing and accept the casualties along the way but we could not last them because we've got more than they've got. So he was the author of Richard that the Grant was a willing and Lincoln wanted him to use in order to, to win the war. So you have an example of a commander-in-chief who uh, 
is truly a commander in chief. And even though he lacks the military experience of his field commanders, nevertheless, if you read the whole panoply of Lincoln's instructions and letters, you, I think most military historians would agree that and Jim, I don't know, I'm not right about this, but that Lincoln really was the best strategist of, of the American Civil War on the northern side. Um, and so he really did function very effectively as a commander in chief. There's one other letter in here which I, again I won't comment on, but you're, if you, those of you who saw the Lincoln movie, uh, you know, there's some pretty dramatic scenes where Mary is working on Abe to uh, keep Robert out of the army. So what, what Lincoln does in the letters here, he writes to Grant and says, uh, Robert very much wants to be in the Army. Would you take him on as a staff officer and keep him out of harm's way, essentially? And that's what happens. So Lincoln is using the power of the presidency to protect his son, while his son has this huge desire to serve militarily. Uh, and we, we know, and, and I think that the, the movie is, is accurate here, Lincoln had a lot of pressure from his wife to keep his son keep her son and his son safe. Uh, now there's this whole section here that, that I will, will ignore, uh, except to say that uh, I wanted to deal with Lincoln's, uh, in, in, great, in some detail, and I'll do this in a general way, sort of assertion of the positive power of the federal government over the power of the states. I mean, that, it's, it's such a theme in American history. Where does federal power end and where does state power begin? Where does the individuals write where they where, where they, within the, a majority democratic uh, government? When, when do we have, when are our rights uppermost and when are we uh, subject to the powers either of state or federal government in order to have a stable and positive society? And Lincoln represents a, a, rather, a revolution here with the assertion of federal power. Again, he's like Washington in that regard. He, believe very strongly in the federal government. And of course, it's so obvious as to why we do so in this particular case, because you've got a bunch of states that are saying the federal government cannot dictate us to us, we can go our own way. We can leave the federal system. And um, so he, he you know, pushes things like the uh, 13th Amendment, uh, in other words, federal power being exerted to deprive the South of its slaves. And again, in, in the movie, and since we've had that as sort of a part of our experience, I should ask, how many of you have seen the Lincoln movie? Yeah, I'm, I'm talking to, to the choir, I think, for the most part. For those of you who haven't seen it, I urge you to get the DVD and, and see it. Um, I, I think one of the questions that can emerge from that movie that is not quite satisfactorily answered is, what's the hurry? Why is Lincoln pushing so hard to get that amendment through Congress? Uh, and uh, it, it's related to uh, one reading that we do have, and I think I will. Uh, it's the Seward letter, which is uh, on the very last sheet on the inside. Uh, and if you remember the movie, he, he's, Lincoln is being pushed by Blair and other Republicans to negotiate with Southern representatives and end this war. If they're willing to negotiate, let's go ahead and negotiate. So Lincoln uh, finally sends Seward off during the process of trying to get the 13th Amendment passed. But this is Lincoln's uh, sort of unconditional surrender type of leadership that he's assuming. He's not, as bad as this war is and as badly as it's gone, he now sees, quote, the light at the end of the tunnel and he's not going to give an inch. So here are Seward's instructions uh, for the peace negotiations that are depicted in the movie. One, the restoration of the national authority throughout all the states. So the union will be restored. That's number one. Number two, no receding by the executive of the United States on the slavery question from the position assumed thereon in the late annual message to Congress and in preceding documents. In other words, pushing for the 13th Amendment. Number three, no cessation of hostilities short of an end of the war and the disbanding of all forces hostile to the government. You, your armies have to surrender. We're not going to leave the field. You have to leave the field. It's unconditional surrender. And the South, obviously, or they do reject that. Well, what Lincoln is worried about, at least one of the things he's worried about, is if the war ends before the 13th Amendment, then what's going to happen? We are going to have elected representatives from the South back in Congress. Are you ever going to get the 13th Amendment to the Congress then? Representatives from Mississippi and 
Alabama and so on? No. And, you know, it might not have happened quickly to get them back, but you could have seen plenty of people saying, well, let's hold off on this amendment until we have a representative group in Congress. So he wants to get that through before the end of the war in order for it to, to be the law of the United States of America. And then with this, these conditions of surrender, the South can't have any recourse. Uh, it's already been done. So that's why, I, I don't, it's hard for the, for the movie to depict all these things, but that's, that's what's going on there with Lincoln's absolute rush to get it passed, even though he's being counseled. Wait, wait I mean, folks, are, are, we can bring this about. So, uh, we've got five minutes left, and let's open this up to a bit of discussion of what you see, having, you know, some, seen some of these documents, what you already know about uh, Lincoln and, and the leadership question. Yes, sir. Thank you. In regards to the movie in Lincoln, I missed it the first time through, but in terms of the uh, discussion and vote on the 13th Amendment, you actually hear the name and the vote and the positive of J.B. Grinnell. That's true. Josiah Grinnell is mentioned by name. That's right. The, the uh, comment from Shane Estes is uh, that in the movie, we have our guy, uh, J.B. Grinnell, voting. They go, it's, they go through not everybody's vote, but it's about the 11th or 12th vote in favor. Josiah Grinnell uh, of Iowa, I forget now how it's been. Tell me. Was he, I mean, he had already lost the election for a second term. Ah. Grinnell. I'm I mean, trying. This is a lame duck session. Of it's a lame duck session. Right. Yeah. And I. And I think that may be so. I don't know what. what the her Tommy Haas's comment, who, Tommy's made a real study of Gerdell and, and, and the Underground Railroad and so on, and she, she's pretty sure, I think she's pretty sure that JB is, is, is a lame duck at this point. Yeah, I, I should know that and I don't, but I, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to accept you as an authority. Of, uh, Ken, Ken Christensen. One of the remarkable things is that, of course, being labeled an abolitionist was thought to be the political suicide in the North by and large, except in the New England states and two places like this. And Josiah V. Grinnell was remarkable because he was an overt abolitionist and he got elected regularly. Yeah, okay, Ken, Ken Christensen is saying that, that uh, I mean, and the Republican Party really is split. You've got the, the radical Republicans who are abolitionists of the first water, uh, mostly from New England states. And then the rest of the Republican Party, which is more moderate, uh, more reflective of a broader range of views on slavery. And J.B. Grinnell, out on the frontier, we really were the frontier, was a radical New England abolitionist in Iowa, and he gets himself elected. So uh, it, it's rather remarkable, because he's sort of going against the main grain of the politics of, of Iowa. They were pretty much the politics of Grinnell, the city of Grinnell. But not of a, a larger section of Iowa. I don't know how many representatives Iowa had then, but it wouldn't have been many, maybe one or two. Certainly one, obviously. Uh, other comments, we've got a minute or two left. Uh, other comments or questions? On, um, you know, to so, so, so quickly summarize uh, on, on the issue of leadership, uh, someone had described, described Lincoln as a hedgehog. He wrote the hedgehog and fox, uh, dichotomy, the hedgehog knows one thing very well. The fox knows many things less well. I'm a fox, <laughs> but I have uh, colleagues who are hedgehogs. <laughs> Today one, Dan Kaiser in the history department, uh, we had a course on, uh, sort of the global history course called Cultural Encounters, where we had five encounters we taught, none of which were connected to, to, to each other, and each was quite individual. Dan hated that course. <laughs> they couldn't, we gotta pull all this together. What's the meaning of all this together? It didn't bother me at all. But the hedgehog, and, and, and historians have described Lincoln as a hedgehog. He, has, he really can't focus on these issues and, and really hold to them. But he has flexibility within that hedgehogness. Uh, and he under, that, that thing I said earlier, he really does understand other people. He, he knows where they're coming from. And a lot of what we see in these letters and his ability to reach out through language to people is 
first of all, you've got to understand where those people are in order to reach out to them in that kind of language. And Lincoln had that ability to project, I would say, from himself into the attitudes of others. Judy's standing there. I think she needs to, to close this. So thank you very much for your patience. We'll go on with uh, Maddie next time. Thank you, George, for the fascinating uh, discussion here today. <clears throat> this is the third of five sessions. We have two more on May 8th and May 14th, and we hope to see you all here for those. Thank you.